Hello, and welcome to the Lighthouse Living Ministry for Women. I am Muriel Gladney, the host. Thank you for joining me for this part two message about citizenship. But the title of this is going to be Guaranteed Weight Loss. Now, but first, before we get going any further, let's give God all the honor. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you for allowing me to encourage your women and men, if they're watching, that your truth is true. No change, unchanged. We thank you. It is our food. Just as we feed our bodies, we have to feed our minds. Thank you for making sure through your writings, through the Holy Scrolls, that we know we are important to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, in the last message, the title of it was Citizenship. And we kind of went through this thing about why the interpreters wrote the words kingdom when the Greek word was basilia, meaning the rule and reign of God. So when Jesus was telling the disciples, thus us, that's every believer who has been called into the body of Christ, he's telling us to seek first the rule and reign of God in our lives and everything else that we need will be added to it. It's a promise. It's an eternal promise. Now, we've also gone through the fact that the builder of anything is the only one who has the right to determine who's going to be in his company. Like you build a company, it's your company. You dictate the rules that go, that basically govern how it's going to operate. No one else can come in and tell you how your business is going to be operated. We have to apply that to what Jesus said in Matthew 16 and 18. He said, I, he didn't say John and Muriel and Judy and whoever. He said, I am going to build my congregation because that's what the word ecclesia church is simply a transformation of ecclesia, which means a congregation. So Jesus is saying, I am going, I am going to build my congregation. And the gates of hell will not be over to overpower it. That settles it. It's a done deal. At least it's supposed to be. So he is the king. Through the father putting people into his kingdom, this first Colossians 12 through 14, we're given to Jesus. Now there, then Jesus was walking with the disciples. Now we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit trains us and tells us exactly what Jesus said. This John 16, verse 13. He's our trainer. He's our corrector. He brings to our memory things that Jesus said. So we have no, Jesus is still king. He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So he's the king. He's the builder of his congregation. That settles it. But what about this, this discipline and this transformation? Because Romans 8 says that we're supposed to be transformed uh, the way the interpreters wrote it into the body of Christ. But now here's a thought. When God called us out of the darkness of Satan's kingdom, he didn't add anything to us. Transformation means through discipline, through tests, he's going to take us back to what he created in the first place. The DNA of God is in every person by the breath. When he breathed into us, he breathed into us his spiritual DNA. It's always been there. But because of Satan, remember that message I gave about the tarnished corn? coin of living in the world, we just got dirty. We got covered up with sludge and muck from the world. 
So when we are transferred into the body of Christ, the spiritual body of Christ, we come in with all that sludge, the mess, the junk. So we have to be cleaned up, trained, reformed, but not new. We're just being taken back to what he created in the first place. Now, how is this done? <laughs> Trials and persecution. Jesus did not leave us in the dark. He said, those who follow me, some translations, you shall suffer persecution. Others say you're going to endure tests. The book of James says we're going to endure tests, trials, etc. But if we're patient and we stay up under the rule and reign of God, we're going to be okay. Now, as we're being transformed, uh, we're also going to be pruned. Remember I said weight loss? <laughs> In John 15, I believe it is, Jesus says the Father is the one who's going to prune us. Now, I'm a gardener, okay? And uh, even vegetables, trees, they don't like to be cut. And your smaller plants, like tomato plants, when we're trimming the dead leaves and things off of the plant, they literally will just almost fold over like, Ugh, because we're actually cutting a live and living plant. But in the morning, because they've been pruned, they've got fresh blood. They don't have to send juice to the dead leaf anymore because it was taking up space. Well, pruning on us is kind of like the same thing. It's like layers of onion. You know, sometimes if you let an onion lay around long enough, the outside layers, they'll start spoiling and rotting. And so you're peeling it off. It's turning black. But when you get right down, you still got some good onion inside that. But you had to peel off all the, the bad layers that were spoiled. That's kind of like us. Drinking, drugging alcohol, adultery, you name it. It's all in Galatians 5. All the spirits that through Satan, we say, oh, what fun? Until that fun kills us. Like I said, I lived that life for 52 years. Well, once I got like 10, so I'd say 40 of the 52. That's all I knew was the world. So when I came in, I had a lot of layers of rottenness. <laughs> it was all that I knew. So as you go through my books, mine, purposely unchained, again, I'm repeating in there again that we, women and men, are valuable in God's plan. It was something that I wasn't taught when I first came in. I had no clue. I'd been in what you call the church buildings for two, three years. No clue that I was essential in this plan of God. No clue. Then the Holy Spirit started teaching me. Like I said, remember I said, I am now going to say I am the spiritual archaeologist. I'm digging and digging and digging. And the truth is there. He's not hiding it. So we got rules, right? We know the first one. What did he tell them? Uh, the Pharisees, I think it was, they said, what is the greatest rule, the greatest law of all? And Jesus says, love God first with everything, heart, body, soul, and all your strength. And he said, and the second one is like it. And people get this still twisted today. He said, love your neighbor, and people stop right there, as yourself. People still today, I'm talking about Christians, people who profess to be Christians, they still think they have to love the neighbor before themselves and will argue that anything contrary to that is being a narcissist. No, Jesus says, love yourself second, love God first. Love yourself second as a valued commodity, if you will, in my plan. You are valued. You are loved. I walked a path to the cross because of love for you. 
I obeyed my father for love of you. So how can we not know we are valuable? You don't die for something that you don't think is worth it. Jesus knew years before, before he became God in the flesh. He knew what was written of him. He walked the path anyway. You don't do that for somebody who's not valuable. He told the disciples, you're more valuable than the flowers in the field. You're more valuable than the birds in the air. You are loved. So yes, ladies, love God first. Understand he created us in love. We are a wondrous creation made in his image and likeness with a purpose, his plan. So we must love ourselves because if he considers us valuable, how can we not? Because here's the thing, and I know this from experience. In the world, I thought, as the world thought, when he began explaining to me when I love him first and then understand that I was valuable in his plan, I started looking at people different. It took some work and it took some time. And I had to ask him a couple of times, can you please put a muzzle on my mouth? Please stop me from speaking first and then thinking later. (laughs) You know, I saw this sign years ago. It says, put brain in gear before mouth in motion. So I had to start saying, put Jesus in gear before mouth in motion. And I started looking at people as he had taught me to look at myself. Every person, no matter how ugly they act, they are still a creation of God. A monkey ape male did not sit up there and speak to his wife female ape and say, let's go make a human uh, human baby. Last I looked, Apes still have eight babies. I don't care. That lie is just straight up from Satan, from hell. The bottom line is that we are made in his image and in his likeness. And he has to clean us up. He had to dunk us in a bath of acid every now and then. Didn't he say, my word is like fire, like a hammer. So I can't burn it off of you. My word is going to literally beat it out of you. And sometimes it does. Some of the things I've done over the years, I wanted to just crawl up under a sofa or a bed or go in a closet and lock the door because I'm like, how could I have done something that stupid? But then I repent. God forgives me. And I learn. I keep growing. And I keep growing until I understand. I need to know who I am. It's not up to nobody else to know who I am. I need to know who I am in his plan. You need to know who you are in his plan. And it's way more advanced than sitting on cushioned. Oh my God. I'm so sorry. Shoot. I'm so sorry. Uh, (laughs) <laughs> didn't mean to do that, but I'm so sorry. Um, that was my phone going off. I forgot to put it on vibrate. But the bottom line is that we have to know who we are. And if we don't know who we are, how can we expect anybody else? God says, I will make room for you before man. But first of all, you have to be in obedience to me. And it's key. So when he gets through pruning us, but here are the rules. Let's talk about the pruning part. Uh, In the Beatitudes, these are rules for the citizens of his kingdom. Now, picture, I'm coming in from the world. And remember, he told the disciples the same thing. They didn't yet know who they were. But he said, hunger and thirst for righteousness. In other words, study the word. Merciful. We are supposed to be merciful. We're supposed to be pure in heart and mind morally. In other words, no more adultery, no more hatred, no sleeping with other people's 
husbands or wives, etc. We are to be peacemakers, ladies. That means when your girlfriend, your best buddy says, if I were you, this is what I would do. And I would do this, that and the other. You have to be the peacemaker and back up and say, no. Have you thought about this from all sides of the issue? Peacemakers. But we had to be taught to do this when we're talked about because people are going to talk about us. People still say, I knew you back when, Mira. And I say, yeah, but look at me now. Look at me now. <laughs> so it's my response, my reaction to what they say. They can't talk about me so bad where I'm going to step off the rock of Jesus. Because that is my foundation now. I know who I am in Christ. Ladies, you are the light of the world. It is my desire through these messages that your light turn into a blazing, roaring fire where you don't even have to say a word. You just walk into a room, a dark room, and your light is going to be so bright, shining from inside and out, because you're going to know who you are, the real you purposed by God. When we walk into a store and people look at you and say, oh, you believe in Jesus. You don't have to say a word. We don't waste time on anger anymore. I feel so sorry for all those th thousands I think the last count, they said 50,000 women were in the Me Too movement. And as they spoke about the things that had been done to them 20, 30 years earlier, they were as hurt the day they were talking about it, 30 and 40 years later, as they were when it happened. That is nothing but Satan. The people who committed those acts, They've gone on They, with their life, probably don't even remember the act. But those women are still in that, that circle of darkness where they can recite everything that they did to them. That was my mother. I asked her one time, mother, tell me something good. And she said, I don't have nothing good to say. I don't know what somebody did to her. I know I don't want any other woman to live 86 years and be that unhappy with their life while sitting on a church pew, reading the Bible, and never understanding that she was loved and valued by God. That's a total waste. We have... And this was the biggie. <laughs> in those Beatitudes, Jesus said, love your enemy. So, of course, me. I said, you got to be joking, right? <laughs> but he said, either we do these things or we're not being transformed. We're not being changed. So when you have somebody tell you, God loves me as I am and I don't have to change, that's a lie from hell. Because we have to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ was not angry with anybody, even though he knew in advance what Judas was going to do to him. He knew what the children of Israel were going to do. He knew what the Romans were going to do. This was not a surprise. And what did he say on the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's the point that this training and tests and challenges is trying to get us to be reconformed to the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. A lot of people preach wealth. <laughs> Jesus says, lay your treasure up in heaven. In other words, we don't worry about trying to chase money. I used to, not anymore. We have to choose love or money. We don't have to worry about him taking care of us. He made a promise. Love God first and everything else you need is going to be handled, handed to you. Now, this is one that Christians love to quote. Judge not, least ye be judged. That's Beatitudes in 7.1. But there's a problem with this. 
It is true on one level. We are not supposed to judge other people as to whether they are a believer or not, whether they truly love Jesus or not. But we are to judge their behavior. If I see Judy, or I'll use me, if, if you see Muriel coming and I'm married, but I'm walking out of a motel with Bob and my husband's name is John, my behavior should be judged. And if you're a friend of mine, you're going to come to me one on one because you're my friend. You're not going to judge what I did, but you're going to come to me as a friend and say, is that the behavior that a person of Christ would be doing? So we are to judge. That's Psalms 1. Because otherwise, when he wrote in Psalms 1, do not run with people who are what, mockers. Do not run with gossipers. The only way you can know not to run with them is if you're watching their behavior. Not judging them, but you're watching their behavior. Like I went to the movies with a friend of mine once uh, because I love movies. And she invited a friend of her. 